Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah
take a, a small private scale landscape construction designer expertise that I had and apply it to the larger scale projects, uh, public realm, education, commercial, environmental improvement uh, all over the world. Um, I've been involved in projects in Dubai, Kazakhstan, uh, St. Petersburg and from the very north to the very south of the UK. Uh, recently with a colleague being successful in uh, being awarded plot number one of 28 at the Chemin Solar Garden Festival in France with a concept arriving from David Shelley which we'll touch on uh, later. Inspiration for me uh, starting my university experience was probably around 2009 when we had a study trip to Germany. The Gleasrick Park in Berlin by Delia Lloyd was something for me that that started to give me a passion to retain original uh, landscape elements, industry, post-industrial landscapes, you know, things with a history. Uh, and also, where we've had this truck with Duisburg as well, with Dusseldorf, which, which is a similar nature. And for me, it was, it was encouraging to see how these spaces, which, which had a historical or cultural element, um, we turned into recreational areas, educational areas, um, experience, uh, the experiences that you could have in these public spaces. Going on to my initial uh, workplace experience, which, which was um, in my fourth year at university. What challenges did I overcome? Uh, what I learned and how I felt? At university, there's a, there's a great glass ceiling of creativity which uh, does push you, you know, to design to your best limits. But um, certainly, when I stepped into the workplace environment, there was a vast amount of information that I either wasn't aware of or wasn't, didn't know existed and never associated with landscape architecture. The lights being contract types and the contractual obliga obligations, something that we had never been touched on. Constructability, I did have previous experience um, from, from personal experience in constructability, but there was, there was le the people who were less experienced in this on the course and actually being involved in a, in a live project soon got you up to speed on that. Budget, surprisingly enough, which contains a lot of our, our designs was, was something else, you know, when we were there. It was, it was very vaguely touched on. The level of information in terms of drawing packages, and then obviously curtailing your <coughs> glass ceiling and creativity in the real world, your British standards, your building control, your planning, your statutory authorities that you need to deal with, and then obviously there's a profit to be made at the end of the day. On the screen here is York Engineers Triangle, which was, was one of the first projects that I got involved in, which was uh, very fitting to um, my inspiration, if you like, when I was aware of my study tour, as this was a, uh, a national management rail centre for Network Rail uh, on, uh, just outside York Central Station in the, in the York Engineers Triangle. So straight away this had um, many issues that we had to, to deal with which I was, I was unaware of as a budding young student which would, in terms of the conservation area, listed buildings and obviously the archaeological dig. You'll see here in the top left uh, part of the archaeological dig and the building and the landscape was, was built over the top of this. This was a, an old Victorian time turning table. So this appealed to me straight away and uh, on the right here you can see some sort of replication and how we tried to retain these features and the, uh, on the right is, an, is the actual centre spot and turning wheel of what lies directly below the ground. I also got opened up to working overseas uh, in Dubai which uh, I went there to work for a few weeks and also uh, remotely, which gave me confidence back in what happened at uni because it was very much like uni and quick ideas, quick concepts, not necessarily uh, worrying about constructability, but it, it opened me up to, to understand there was two very extreme scales in the landscape architectural world. 
uh, my, my current workplace experience. Uh, so my <coughs> initial workplace experience did affect my outlook and did affect my approach uh, to these pro to projects. It is a completely different skill set over and above what you obtain at university. On a daily basis now, <coughs> I deal with project administration, project of different scales, different sectors, uh, and also professional integrity, something that, that has been developed along the way. An initial project start for both of these projects that you see here, the top being the North East Schools uh, <coughs> in the North East of England, which was, uh, which I was project landscape architect on for four primaries and two secondaries. Uh, so this was obviously a totally different approach to what you would do at uni when starting this project. Adopting a specimen design, statutory consultees and, and planning, for example. Below you'll see <coughs> Blackburn Wheel Sports Facility, just to show the scale here. I worked <coughs> with a client who was who didn't understand the process, uh, it was very much we were uh, hand-holding. It was big lottery funded, which again opened up more doors and also had to control the tendering for a design and build subcontractor to obviously build the skate park. Now in practice, over the years since I've graduated, I do feel I am a better landscape architect, if I can say that. Um, through the development of my professional integrity, maybe at university <coughs> I didn't have the flair in designs, if you like, but um, I certainly <coughs> feel after my experience of my work placement, I felt I paid more attention in how my designs could be constructible and more realistic in terms of some which were still very much out there. Strunar Gateways is one which was a very um, reassuring project for myself. Uh, competition success being shortlisted for the Reba Journal McCune Award and it's also just been shortlisted in the Scottish Design Awards. This was one that I worked on myself for project administration and yeah, I did relate back to university roots in the very initial stages of this. It's good just to know, to be reassured that your work, if you like, is people appreciate your work uh, throughout this space. Uh, Shimon Salawar has been touched on a few times already tonight, but I thought it was important to include this just to what inspires me to be a better landscape architect, not only at the time of university, but also now. I think competitions do. Competitions inspire me to be a better landscape architect. I've submitted to a few competitions, but don't get me wrong, it's not something you can submit to all the time when you're um, part of a company, as it's not, it's not feasible to be constantly submitting for competitions, but um, to be selected as the plot number one of 28 at Chemin Solar International Garden Festival in France was, was a great experience. The garden, it was, the brief for the garden was very open-minded open and it did remind me of, of university projects especially with the, the brief being design a garden for the coming century. Um, we used, we being me and my colleague Anka, uh, used Mary Shelley's novel of Frankenstein and how this had a relation to science, how science was good, how science was bad, how science has developed through the years, how it's became used for the likes of GM crops and also for the likes of cloning. Um, also a thing to, uh, to, to do with senses, to do with combinations, contrasting materials that won't necessarily be placed together to intrigue that within your mind. Mirrors that give distorted images. A place that does make you feel uneasy, uh, but all, all part of the, of the design concept. Here's a few images here, um, all off the press, which haven't been released anywhere else yet, but uh, and, uh, we had, we organised a construction team, we went and built it ourselves, uh, over a two-week two course, 
and uh, here, this is uh, yeah, some of the, the final images. The, we're back in France next week for official opening, the fourth when it is then open to the public. It's a part of a Chemin sur le Loire domain, which is a large uh, chateau. You probably won't see this, but there's um, some flyers and stuff that were out earlier to do with the garden and the actual uh, domain itself. Uh, me and Anka would be happy to talk to anybody who's wanting to know a little bit more at the end. If you're hanging around for drinks, but please, if you're not, take away a flyer. And if you're um, wanting to quiz us or anything, please get in touch. So to sum up, I love my job as a landscape architect. Two days are never the same. Two projects are never the same. I can fulfil my passion for the great outdoors, which relates to my childhood, and for design. Um, I love it even more knowing my designs are benefiting members of the public of all ages. But I would also say, and just open up some questions probably for debate, within my short time in practice, there is a hole that's developed in the education system, uh, which preparing graduates for the professional world maybe could be addressed a little more. Um, their lack of knowledge, yeah, just a, I think there's a, a, a lack of knowledge and there, there needs to be something addressed there for the sharing between uh, landscape architects and education. You'll see here as well, this is landscape architecture. Um, WLAM 2016, which has been running this month as World Landscape Architecture Month. This is, it was originally started by the American Society of Landscape Architects, but um, I think in terms of promotion for our profession, you know, it's something we've, we've latched onto, but could there be more done uh, locally in Scotland and uh, within the UK? Because I feel there is um, I, feel, I feel that the profession is not promoted enough. Uh, as you can imagine, when you, you maybe tell somebody you're a landscape architect, and the direct reply is you design a garden, or you design gardens. You know why? Why can we not have a promotion or have have something there that you look at a building, you think an architect's done it. You look at an interior, you an interior design done it. There's a lot of things out there that people would look at and not even associate um, with landscape architecture. But I think um, the LIS Reflections is a great start to addressing these underlying issues and uh, hopefully will be successful in transferring knowledge and engaging discussions between members in the landscape profession. I do know a lot more now about the profession than I did when I originally started and would I have changed my mind about studying to be a landscape architect? No. <laughs> Thank you. in France under landscape architects Jules Clement, Jacques Simon and Jules Beckard. Since 2004, Eleanor was based in Paris and has gained experience developing and managing a wide range portfolio of landscape design projects. Um, and following her return to UK in 2015, she's continued to develop the personal practice of projects in Mon Morocco, France and Switzerland. Following on from Eleanor, we're going to have Felicity Steers. A director of Glasgow-based practice ERZ and developed, helped found the company in 2007. Prior to the patchwork career, has involved teaching in Edinburgh, Glasgow, USA, and Australia. An early stint as director of City Design Cooperative and associate for Land Use Consult. Felicity's career has been underpinned by a little travel adventure by and her fine art background degree and a strong sense of social responsibility. Questions will follow at the end of Felicity's speech. <coughs> 
please welcome Eleanor up. straight back to France and most of my career has actually been in France. Um, I've only moved back to the UK in 2015 um, to start working here at ECA as a teaching fellow and also to begin developing my own practice. So um, I, we were sent uh, quite a few interesting questions uh, to develop this presentation and of course it sends you straight back to thinking about those early formative years. So. I kind of followed, the, the presentation follows the, the questions that we were asked and they opened up obviously um, quite interesting things and it was, it's, it's just interesting as well and it's quite inspiring to hear um, Mikael's presentation because it, it's, um, bring, it, it, question, it makes me question as well things that I've put together for this presentation. Um, so the first thing I'd like to talk about is the challenges of the first years of entering work after graduation. Um, the, um, the first job that I took when I went back to France was for a very reputed uh, um, office and I remember the first day, I think coming from ECA where it is very open and very creative. I think the first, even the first day in the office, I remember asking, as I was given a guide around the office, where's all the model making equipment? <laughs> Where does this get messy? And do we start? And I was told, oh no, well we don't really develop our projects that way. And I think even from maybe that first day, some alarm bells started ringing for me. So I, I gave up my best shot and I unfortunately really, really struggled in the office. I didn't find the opening up or the possibility for creativity and you start asking yourself questions, am I in the right profession, is this for me? And I think this, that, that moment can be very hard for a lot of people leaving uh, university and moving into the world of work. Uh, you also, as, as has just been discussed, sometimes you just don't feel equipped, you don't feel like you have all the skills, you feel like there's so much that you still need to learn and it can be very challenging. Um, I think the main thing is that if you end up in an office or a practice that you feel is not suited to you, sometimes you just have to admit it and maybe search for your own path and try different things. I think that we all have certain strengths and weaknesses. Uh, there are parts of the, the practice of landscape architecture is so vast actually as we just discussed, it's going from a, maybe a garden scale or planting design or ecological concerns to uh, dealing with big post-industrial sites. Everyone has a certain speciality. So I think for graduating students, you're still trying to get to know your, yourself. You're still trying to get to know your strengths and your weaknesses and your interests. And I think that the, those first years can be quite a struggle. Um, I, I, and I, after six months, realised that the practice I was working in was just not the, the place for me. Um, and I was, I ended up moving back to the office where I'd done my work experience, which was with Michelle Devine. Um, it was a difficult decision to make because I'd already had a work experience there and I knew how hard <laughs> the life was working in that office, but 
And I think there was that I was able, I, I went back to a place where I felt that I could grow and develop and test things, and that was quite exciting for me. So we're also going to show some slides to kind of take you through this journey. <laughs> so I have uh, included just a few slides of the work that I developed here at ECA as part of my uh, final year graduated work. So at that time I was quite interested in um, developing kind of wide-scale landscape transformation through strategic interventions. And as I mean, I'm working here now, <laughs> so I, I feel like, in, in maybe in opposition to some of the things that the first speaker said, an academic institution, particularly within an art college, has to <coughs> encourage students to be creative and to test the boundaries of what landscape architecture can be. This doesn't mean that an accredited, you know, an, this is an accredited course and we have to equip students with the, the tools and the skills for the world of work. But I think that creativity, I don't think we should see it as something which is antagonistic to, those, to the constraints. Because all the constraints that you have to deal with, I think creativity is actually the strongest tool that you have in your box as a designer to deal with all those things, that you, all the decisions that you have to make. Um, to get a project through, if, if you don't have the skill of being creative and making things work, then I think every single decision and everything you have to do along the way is quite difficult. So these are just some slides of things that I was experimenting with in my graduating year, so I think we can pass quite quickly <laughs> over that. Um, and then I will come on to show how I started to, I think the experience that I had at Michelle Devine's office allowed me to test, to see how in, a, in reality some of the things that I've begun to explore at ECA, how those things can be tested and brought together <coughs> even on this big scale but through um, making transformations in the real world. And the, the approach through, through making and through drawing that was very strong in that office is something that um, corresponded to a way that, that I understood of working out a project. So I've just taken this uh, quote which is um, talking about the role of drawing in Michelle's work which is very important and I would say drawing but as a wider thing drawing and making. So here are just, this is just I've just shown, shown two projects that I worked on here, but here we see the drawings and the testing, and most importantly, the models. So, a project like this project um, for the Right Bank in Bordeaux has been constantly developed at every single scale of the project, was developed through making models and through developing drawings. So, here we can see how these things were tested in one. Put together. And a constant questioning. Quite a lot of the work was developed through prototypes. So we would test things in models in the office and then we would test them on site through, I mean, everyone, I'm sure lots of you in your offices, you're making prototypes on site. But I think one of the questions that we were asked is what do you think in, in your early years of work made you a better landscape architect? The thing that I think I've really taken from working with Michelle is a constant questioning. Never content with the final project, always trying to push it. And quite often being unhappy with the results and then completely overhauling it and testing it again. And this is something, I think this capacity for self-criticism is, is the thing I would say from those formative years that I really, really took forward and I suppose bring back my it into ECA and this is something that we encourage students to do is to be self critical. Um, it was actually the first time I ever met Michel Devine was here at ECA because he came to give the David Skinner lecture and as he presented his own work every single project he presented he said well this is what I did and this is how we built it and this is how it turned out but if I was to do it again I wouldn't do it like that at all. <laughs> And I think that that capacity, that rigour and capacity for self-criticism is the one thing that I, uh, if I had to put it down to one thing, I would say that's what I really took away from that experience. Um, so just in through some of these, so again here just a kind of snapshot of maybe a tiny, tiny fraction of the model making that went on in the office. 
Um, a pro and again, just as another example, a project like this project that you think Eve's ago, um, really the transformation of a very big area to the north side of Paris. Um, because these projects, so the, the Bordeaux project and the Eastgam project are projects that lasted, I think, from even when I first started my work experience in 2004, and some of these projects are still ongoing. So under, I think sometimes in university you, you see these things happening, you know, you have a couple of months to do a project or something like that. In reality, these projects take years and years and years, and I think it's the time factor and the, the possibility to develop and test and maybe go back and revise, which is interesting uh, in landscape. So again, I will go very quickly, we don't have a lot of time today, but just showing a snapshot of the development of the models and then how that came to be. Um, I just wanted to include this slide, um, just again reinforcing this idea about the drawing and the making. These, um, this is an uh, exhibition which is part of the Pompidou Centre now. So the Pompidou Centre actually bought some of these works from Michel. Um, so something else that I think is very strong in, in the work of that office, where I spent so many years, is that even the development work, every drawing and every model, not that they're necessarily precious, but they have a certain quality to them. So the exploration that we do as designers um, we should, we should. I think we should be proud of it. You know, I think sometimes as a as a designer, it's you, you maybe are asking a question, and the thing that's quite hard is, you know, what is it that you're selling? Because you're selling somehow ideas, I suppose. And I think what was really just fantastic in the purchase of these works by the Pompidou Centre is somehow there is an understanding that there is a real value in that work. And, and the making and the drawing is uh, really important. Um, so yeah, I think probably taking far longer than we <laughs> probably will take. But there's so much just there's just obviously lots of discussions that can happen after this presentation. So we're just going to go extremely quickly through a snapshot of work that I've been doing uh, without any comment, just uh, to show, I suppose, the way that I am now trying to develop my own work, but also through developing the drawing and the making and the hands-on uh, part of the, the of landscape architecture is really important, and that's something that I try to bring through in my own work. And finally, to sum up, and again, the first speaker touched on this uh, question as well, is this lack of um, transference between the academic world or education of landscape architecture and the practice of landscape architecture. So I suppose, as I said at the beginning of the talk, none of, none of us, I think, graduating and arriving in the world of work felt that we were fully equipped to be, a, you know, we, we are formed as a landscape architect, but we are not necessarily fully formed. I think as a landscape architect, you every single project, you will always be learning new things. And that is why it is, um, I think that's why we can be so passionate about it, because we are constantly learning. Um, I mean, here in ECA, I think that, I, I don't think that the education that students are having now in this institution is that different from the education that I got. And although I wasn't completely fully formed and fully equipped, I think that it was a good education. And I think that there are things that are happening here which are which are very positive in terms of um, <coughs> students to move forward. As well. I think it, that will be quite an interesting debate to have, and that there are things that we can obviously do to improve it. Um, so I just hear a few slides, but there are lots of things that we do in terms of getting students out into doing field work. Um, being involved even in some projects with public consultations or presenting to the public, having public exhibitions. There's a studio that I've been working on this semester where students have been collaborating with uh, architecture students in the architecture department, so getting a taste for um, what we all <laughs> uh, know that we have to deal with in practice, which is this collaborating with different disciplines. And I think that that's been something where the students had to admit it actually 
in a very interesting way mirrored everything that happens to us in the world of work. And so I think there are, there are things that we can do to um, help to equip students to move into the world of work, and uh, I'd be interested to hear anybody's ideas and stuff like that. Um, so that's the end. I suppose the, we were asked to leave with a one piece of advice, I think, that was suggested. But I, the only piece of advice, and I give this advice to all the students, is that I just think we have to be, we have to be really passionate about what we do. I'm sure everybody in this room is already, because um, if we are not passionate about it ourselves, nobody else is going to be. <laughs> Thank you so very much. much. During my year out, I had spent 12 months sitting in an office colouring in golf courses with Panto Marker, and I had absolutely no clue about how I was going to do it. Constructability wasn't even a word I'd heard of. And I didn't feel at the time that the teaching was very good about construction. I was a bright kid, and it was opaque, confusing, and really alien. Um, sort of couched in macho speak, really. What I have realised since is that if something seems opaque, confusing and alien, it was almost definitely dressed up in jargon in order to increase somebody else's status. And this is really vital, vital information for the graduating landscape architect because at some point, probably quite early on in your career, career you are going to have to deal with road engineers. <laughs> Um, so I had a revelation during the final year talking to my grandmother. My grandmother was a tailor who used to make costumes for the theatre at Stratford. Um, I'm not afraid to bring a very feminine perspective to my design work. I'm proud of being um, from a long line of female artisans and my grandmother was someone that I greatly respected 
And she said, don't worry about construction and engineering, it's basically just the same as sewing. <laughs> now you're laughing, but it's actually completely true. So I base all my construction on sewing, which is something that I intuitively understand. Um, and I'm really passionate about construction. I became passionate about it in final year, and I still am. This is from my final year portfolio, and everything then was hand-drawn. I got it out to take the photograph, and it's a beautiful fat book with tracing paper and pencil drawings. And I still think there are the details, and you can see the influence of sewing. Um, but I, I use sewing a lot in my practice. I think about stitching things together, overlapping layers, constructing shapes, um, a background and pattern making is extremely useful. I wish I had come out of Edinburgh College of Art with a grand plan with strategy for my career. This is me uh, focusing on my career by running a market store with my friend Kelly in final year selling vintage clothes, because obviously that's really relevant. Um, the only concrete plan I had was to move to Glasgow to be with my boyfriend, and so that's what I did. Building on what Eleanor said, um, what happened next really was a bit of a disaster. I had six jobs in five years, and despite working with some really fantastic people, I ended up with a growing feeling that I had wasted seven years at Edinburgh College of Art. I could find no niche, I found no satisfaction, or very little satisfaction in my work. The very first thing that I built, which was a pub garden in the Central Belt, was demolished before it opened. <laughs> um, so, I just, and, you know, I was full of ambition, I had first, I wanted to change the world, and it was an extremely, extremely difficult transition from college where I felt very successful to a career where I felt lost. Um, I eventually quit. I had quite a good job at Land Use Consultants, which I can't say I didn't enjoy, but I didn't feel at that point that it was going in the direction I wanted it to go in. And I went abroad, I went to teach at Penn State, and then in Adelaide, and I taught landscape architecture and drawing for two years abroad. My family were absolutely and totally horrified by this. I was 28. I was at a stage where I was supposed to be settling down, um, instead of which I jetted back to America. I'd done my year out in America, so actually quite a lot like Ellen and I ended up going back to where I'd done my year out. Um, it was the best thing ever. It was brilliant. To teach, I actually had to read the books that I was supposed to read when I was at college. Um, I had to team teach in uh, Penn State with an ecologist and planner, and in Adelaide, for the first two years, the students, the architecture and landscape architects, students have thought to get taught um, uniformly, they have all the same classes, so I taught with architects. I had an experience of being the external examiner for the graduating architects in Adelaide, and actually my whole world just came back into colour through teaching, and I still teach whenever I can. And it, it reawoke in me the reasons that I had become a landscape architect in the first place and I decided that I would go back and try and make a go of it. So at this point a strategy did finally kind of come into place and I think I realised at that point that the only way I was going to make any sort of career was going to be by working for myself but I couldn't do that immediately so I went back home, I did a little bit of time teaching here and then I went back into private practice at Landry's where I was an associate for four years. I really applied myself and I think it was a really good apprenticeship for what happened next. So in 2007, Rolf and I set up ERTS um, and I've now managed to stick at what is my 11th job for eight years. I'm not bored very much and um, we do have a strategy. We have a five-year rolling plan which is actually based on um, fulfilling our personal goals as designers rather than on business. But it's, it's not, I'll come back to that. <laughs> I still teach as much as I can, and it brings new ideas, and it cuts through a lot of the conventions that can limit you in practice. And the conventions that limit you in practice are quite a lot like jargon, and you should just laugh at them and ignore them, and I really, really mean that. Ertz was set up to create, create an environment in which Rolf and I would be happy to work long term. Um, it's not a lifestyle company. 
it's a viable business model based on collaborative working. So we see ERTS as an umbrella that allows us to collaborate with a really wide range of people on a really, really wide range of projects. And that actually gives us a great deal of economic stability. So during a time of great recession, we've grown from one person to our biggest 10 people. Um, our portfolio is crazily diverse and that stops us being bored. So we do everything from art installations to strategic planning um, and sometimes all in one day. In the office, we've got five to six different disciplines. Many of us wear two hats. I'm an illustrator as well as a landscape architect. Murray's an architect and an urban designer. Chris is a landscape architect and a professional photographer. So we, we bring lots and lots of different things into the office and use them all. And we will collaborate with anyone who is good and open-minded. Um, the dot-com list guy said, only work the best. Um, I honestly think that Ertz is the best team that I have ever worked with and I think you can question what's the best and I think that is a really important question for people leaving university. What is the best to you? Um, the most negative environment that I've ever worked in, and I won't name names, but it was a really famous, uh, successful, one of the world's most successful architecture practices there in London and I was seconded there in land use consultants twice and it was absolutely totally bloody horrible, hierarchical, intimidating, non-convivial, and those are all the antipathy of how I would wish to work. Um, this is from the, the entrepreneur's list of things to do in California. Uh, I thought about renaming this slide Stop Whinging, <laughs> but I think, uh, and this builds a little bit on some of the earlier discussion. As landscape architects, we're prone to moaning about how undervalued we are, how no one understands us. Um, this is just a story. We applied with a very good and rather famous architect to do Arcadia Nursery for Edinburgh University. I really, really wanted the job. At the time, my own youngest two kids were two and four and were still in nursery and I was, it was very close to my heart and I worked extremely hard to put a really excellent bid together with the architect and we pitched really well and we got to the final two teams. The other team were the people that had done the feasibility study and they had no landscape architect at all for a nursery that had a very, very large piece of ground. Um, the interview went really well. We talked a great deal about inside-outside play and about the role that outside play plays in education. And it, we thought we'd got it. And then we got a phone call saying it had gone to the team that had done the feasibility study who had no landscape architect at all. And so out came the Prosecco, out came the Winching. <laughs> oh, God, how much value we are. Two days later, we got a phone call from the winning team saying that our interview had convinced the client at Edinburgh University that a landscape architect was extremely essential to this job. Um, and uh, would we put in a fee and resubmit? So we had to resubmit a whole new pitch against two other landscape architects, which was immensely frustrating, but we got the job. Um, Arcadia Nursery has won 15 design awards. It's an absolutely wonderful, wonderful nursery. I, I wish my children could have gone there. Um, and we've just been appointed to do Arcadia 2. So, a happy story. Hold your heads up high. Another myth about landscape architecture is that there is some sort of dichotomy between serious scientific meaningful landscape design and aesthetics. That's absolute bollocks, okay? Um, the Landscape Institute in England just ran a conference called Beauty in the Age of Austerity and some of the post-publicity for that, I didn't go to it, I would have quite liked to, but I couldn't, um, had a, a professor, I think, at one of the universities declaring that by considering beauty we make ourselves less valuable and less serious and less whatever. Um, my way around this is not really to discuss beauty with our clients or in bids or anything else. They just get it whether they like it or not. Um, beauty is not an extra. All projects at Earth's aim to be beautiful and I hope are beautiful. 
Um, our current work involves integrated green network strategies, sustainable urban design systems, multifunctional green spaces, placemaking, um, work for dementia, health and wellbeing. They tick all the serious issues, boxes, and they are all, you know, thorough and rigorous and scientific, but they're all beautifully designed. Why not? It's free to design things beautifully. And if you don't believe that, I really would suggest travelling to places like Vietnam or Mexico where you can really learn about beauty in the age of austerity. We have no excuse in this country not to build things that are beautiful. I met Ian McCarg, the Sean Connery of landscape <laughs> I met him twice. I thought he was horrible, actually. <laughs> Particularly when he critted us during the third year at the College of Art. Um, However, he always swore that landscape architecture is the profession of the future. The most important issue of the 21st century will be the condition of the global environment. He saw us at the front of the solutions for the 21st century, and I still believe that as a profession we are at the front. The problem is that the rest of the world hasn't caught us up at all yet. Um, so at Ertz we are looking at water management, dereliction, contamination, society and the ways of rejoining and creating a more convivial society in an age of digital communication, environmental psychology, economic regeneration, health, well-being, global warming, drainage. Um, these are all key issues. We are acting locally and thinking globally, as all landscape architects have always been trained to do. And we're ahead of the game. Um, you have to strive really hard to remain ahead of the game. And sometimes it can be really dispiriting because you're on your own as a profession. But I do believe that, that we are. To remain ahead, you need to be extremely adaptable and collaborative. So personally, I draw no slight boundaries on the plan. I draw no professional boundaries and I draw no professional boundaries for myself or for anybody else. So within our office, we work completely as a team. Nobody is an architect or a landscape architect or an urban designer. We are all just the team. Um, and we will work with anyone who's good, intelligent, questioning, and hopefully, and um, preferably rather fearless and willing to take risks. I had, and Seamus will like this story, um, I used to teach on the postgraduate course here at Edinburgh College of Art, and I came to that job with some prejudice. Um, as an undergraduate student, we were kind of taught to think that the postgraduates were untrainable cheats, you know, they could somehow managed to become a landscape architect by not doing any work and uh, not suffering for seven years. Um, I quickly learned that that's total nonsense, of course, and. What I would say is one of the best students I ever had, and perhaps Seamus would remember her, had an undergraduate degree in hotel management. So, you know, we need the people that are coming in from other professions and other disciplines because that is the way forward. And what is happening, as many of the people in practice would be aware, is that people are muscling in on our territory anyway. So you can either, you know, put up boundaries or you can just welcome that and, and embrace really good collaboration. Finally, and uh, it's, it's quite nice how these talks are slotted together a little bit. Um, I've got my notebook. Hang on, I just need to get a quote. Sorry about this. Going back to Darwin. I was looking at this yesterday and I just added it in at the last minute. I, um, David from the office who's sitting over there, sent me a link to a conference on drawing, which is being organised by the Bartlett School in London, and I just saved it as a really good bit of jargon. Listen to this. Um, drawing Futures will focus on the discussion of how the field of drawing may expand synchronously alongside technological and computational developments. Bringing together practitioners from many creative fields, the conference will discuss how drawing is changing in relation to how technologies for the production and dissemination of ideas are developing. Far from killing it, technology promises new avenues for the drawn as a speculative method and its future allows to shape. <laughs> <laughs> I was quite put off. <laughs> I wasn't sure my drawing was good enough. And then I thought, well, it's, you know, laugh at the jargon. I've translated it for you. It means 
keep drawing. It's the most vital design tool now and in the future. <laughs> very much to all our wonderful speakers tonight. I hope they've been an inspiration to you um, from everything from years just straight out of college to uh, what it's like as you get further on in your career. Um, I'd like to ask if we've got any questions for our speakers on the floor. Not that I can see you because you're all in darkness there. Anybody? Well, I, here's one I prepared earlier. <laughs> Greg, wherever you are, unless you've gone out for the beer. Um, one thing, the Frankenstein Garden demonstrates a wonderfully creative and playful design process. Um, this is something that sometimes gets lost as landscape architects progress from student to seasoned practitioner. Uh, we've had some helpful advice there from Felicity, but what advice have you got to help the oldies keep that inventiveness and joy in creativity whilst managing the day-to-day -day environment of running a business, making money, winning work, dealing with engineers and jargon? Greg, wherever you are. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. Well, well-written question. <laughs> 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 I think it, um, as like what I was saying, just how do I be a better landscape architect? You know, the competitions I think is a thing. I you know people will do them, people won't do them. But even if you don't want to have that tie to being a competition, it's like what the person what I was saying about drawing. I think drawing is a keen thing that gets quickly lost now in this day and age. With everybody either being in front of a computer or in the light. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the likes, and I think, especially at that concept stage, and all the way through your project, and uh, I think it's it's good to keep developing your, your drawing skills, and I think that's something that, that um, certainly helped me and Anka arrive at a concept and you know, develop the garden for Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. Can I, can I contribute as their <laughs> managers, sitting both sides of me? Sure. The, the, thing, the thing that I saw with the garden was that it absolutely re-energised them. They just, they just had fun doing what it. What were you doing to them? <laughs> dealing with engineers, dealing with QSs, um, job, yeah. trying to win the next work, all that, as you said. But it, it gives them a fresh start as well, keeps them energised, and they've had a, just a, a good time and a fun time doing it. Yeah. And to actually go to France and build it physically with their own hands. Mm -hmm. There's another country to factor as well. Okay, thanks very much. Anybody else got any other questions? Oh, hello there, Danny. Well, yeah, I mean, we knew AHR when it was, was golfers rather than Is there any creativity in those words? <laughs> Only if you were uh, vandalising uh, fire hydrants and things like that. But uh, we'll talk about that later. Um, Felicity's comments that um, we should embrace certainly not be frightened of other professions in, encroaching um, and that has been I think probably in the last 10 years a very dominant part of the conversation around urban design, environmental design etc. I find that very, very interesting and actually I think it's quite uh, empowering because um, titles are one thing, they're important but they're not everything, it's about the work and I think that um, it's very very interesting that you were saying that in some ways the collaboration is uh, the, the main thing and in some ways maybe you could add to this but I think that the training in communication is one of the strongest things we've got. And I think that you know, communicating our ideas and our skills and our transferable skills is something that we maybe don't do enough because that, that's the answer, you know, uh, that, that will help. And, and I think our, our power to pull different professions together, when they're very siloed particularly, um, is, is a strength. And that came across very clearly, so I'm grateful for that comment. Thank you. Yeah, I was, I was meaning to say, but I forgot based on what Ellen was saying, that um, it was really good to hear that she's running projects at ECA that are in collaboration with the architecture department, because when I was a student, we had one project through the whole five years, which was a rubbish project, 
um, and we didn't do any projects with the town planners who were in the, on the floor beneath us. And actually, we should be starting that collaborative process in education. I think education is a place for ideas. I don't think it's a place for learning about contracts, but it would be a fantastic place to start good collaborative working. Yeah, just, just to reinforce what Felicity is saying, when I was here at UC, we did a project with town planners as well. And the main thing was they didn't even know what last project was. <laughs> that was the start of the conversation, <laughs> which was quite worrying. <laughs> that was only 10 years. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to, because we're a bit tight for time, not that I've, um, you know, I've regretted any of the time spent listening to speakers, they've all been wonderful, but can we please put our hands together again to uh, say thanks to all our wonderful speakers this evening, Greg, Eleanor, and Felicity. Thank you very much.